Okay, so I'm going to disappear. Thank you all for like logging in tonight. Um, enjoy the session with Verna, um, and I'll see you in a, in a while. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, thank you for the invitation. I hope you can all hear me all right. I think a few people are experiencing a bit of a technical issues, but they're being sorted in the chat. Um, so th thank you for the invitation. As Daniel has already said, I had to travel to South Sea from Bristol, where I live, uh, to uh, offer this evening of meditation and reflection. But circumstances have changed uh, very quickly. And so it's become an online thing. Um, at the same time, I had to reconsider my whole talk and evening. So I was supposed to do something else, but conditions being what they are, they, um, they like to show how unreliable they are from time to time. And so um, a bit of, of an apology that I had to put up the material for today rather hastily, quickly this, this weekend. So we'll see what comes up. The title is COVID or Co-Life. Um, this is actually a wordplay in Spanish. I realized that the, the Spanish word for life is vida, which is, so COVID is just one vowel away from meaning co-life, life together in Spanish. Doesn't work as well in English, but, um, but here we go. And the subtitle is From Fear to Love to Community. And it sketches a little bit what I will be talking about. How we are meeting this situation right now. And fear is one of the reactions that naturally come up for us, for a lot of us. And I include myself in this but we can use the same encounter with this raw reality to elicit other responses like love, not only for one another, but for the wider community. And so we can use this situation right now to really practice, to commit, and as a sort of way to strengthen our sense of how connected we are and how much we need each other. Um, the way this is going to go is very soon we're going to do a meditation about 25, 30 minutes. And then I'll speak for about half an hour again. And then through your questions and interaction in the chat, uh, hopefully we can have some fruitful discussion. So during the session, you can use the chat uh, amongst yourselves. You can drop questions in the ask a question tab, as Daniel has said. Um, and then at the end, I will gather some of those. And with Daniel and I, we try to respond to those. But before we jump to the formal meditation, I just wanted to do a quick check-in. So just in whatever posture you find yourself right now. Just maybe straighten, strengthen, um, straighten your back. Close your eyes for a second. Maybe take a couple of conscious breaths. And simply drop the question of what are the most predominant feelings and responses that you are seeing in yourself in relationship to this whole pandemic situation. So just checking in with yourself to see in the last few days what have been frequent visitors what has populated the landscape of your inner world.
what has come to the surface. Welcoming whatever arises in this very quick inquiry. And see if you can summarize in a couple of words, a couple of adjectives, what you find, what you have been feeling in the past few days. And my suggestion is that whenever you find those two or three words that describe what you have been feeling uh, relating to COVID 19, you drop them in the chat. And in this way, we start to connect with each other. We start forming some ties, some community. And at the same time, we might realize that our feelings overlap and we may be experiencing similar things. And I'll just give another minute for whoever wants um, to pop those in the chat. It's not compulsory. And without any judgment of what we put in or what others put in. So just, just to name this, I'm seeing a lot of fear coupled with a lot of hope. And I'm seeing also quite a lot of uncertainty. A lot of people are mentioning uncertainty. Worry, hope. This is in line with what I have been feeling and what I expected. Um, and I hope to address those in some way or another um, today. So um, you can continue if you're still writing that, but I would like to move on to the main meditation. And this will take about 25 minutes. So if you want to, to start uh, finding your formal posture of meditation, maybe stretch a little bit, be comfortable. And I stress be comfortable um, for this session. So if you now perhaps bring your attention to yourself, leave the chat on the side and close your eyes. You can leave them half open, however you usually practice. And I will guide this meditation but at any point, if you prefer, you can always revert back to your usual mode of practice. <clears throat> 
if you feel that safer, if you feel that can be useful for you at that moment. I will drop certain suggestions during the meditation. And again, if something I'm suggesting is not particularly helpful for you, it's not working, and the previous thing was working, you can go back to that. So just settling into your body. Noticing points of contact. The back straight without strenuous effort. The neck relaxed, the jaw soft. The arms resting. and entering into the meditation without any sense of hurry. And keeping a sense of openness. Perhaps you can be aware of the whole body sitting, the general sensation of being here, sitting. And we will keep this degree of openness throughout the meditation, resisting any tendencies of attention to get narrow, sucked into something, <clears throat> exclusively and approaching this rather as an exercise in being very close to experience but still wide and open feel your breath And as you may do usually, you can rest your attention on the sensations of breathing. If this is not helpful to you, you can continue with the whole body sitting, the contact of the hands. But if you use the breath, I suggest that you don't try to pin it down, that you keep this openness, this whole body awareness, this wide space, and let the breath manifest itself, perhaps in different ways than yesterday or the day before when you practiced. and keeping this wide gaze. You may feel the breath like a sensation of expansion and contraction. Or maybe some tension and release. or maybe a movement up and down.
whenever your mind wanders. You just bring it back to this very simple experience in the present moment. But also if you feel your attention narrowing, getting tense, just stretch it a little bit. Make it wide. If you feel the breath at a very particular area, it's a very sharp point. You can of course rest your attention there, but I suggest you keep some background awareness of the body, of sounds, to keep this degree of openness. You can feel whatever reactions your body has to external circumstances, body sensations, thoughts, and you just acknowledge them and give them space. Taking us some sort of refuge or protection, this wide space that you are allowing for yourself with some kind attention resting literally resting in the simplicity of this exercise And now, as you settle into this exercise, 
I want you to include in your awareness anything that is good or nice about the present moment. To become somehow perceptive to the nice. This does not mean now that you have to run around to look for something amazing that is happening right now. And if you don't find it, you're somehow failing at this. But it's just to open up this sensitivity of what is okay right now that I might overlook. And you don't have to do anything with it. Just open to it and acknowledge it and include this especially within your awareness of the present moment with the breath and the body. And this might be the relative silence of the room you're in. It could be a part of the body that feels comfortable. Or perhaps the breath is pleasant in some subtle or not so subtle way. Perhaps one aspect of the breath. The beginning of the in-breath, some point of the out-breath, anything that's comfortable. So we include in our awareness any degree of well-being that is present right now. It doesn't have to be intense, special, and you don't have to do anything with it. But it's one more thing you rest with. You can, in a way, enjoy it, appreciate it, smile with it. You can smile with your attention, cultivating some sense of contentment and appreciation. Perhaps it's just the simple pleasure of being in the present moment with mindfulness. and aware of this well-being you breathe in as if expanding it ever so slightly and you breathe out as if releasing or releasing it into the world making the in-breaths vitalizing and the out breaths relaxing.
And to continue, I would like to invite you to bring to mind something that inspires you. Anything that gives you a sense of inspiration. This can be a person, a goal, project, ideal, even just a quality, some human quality that inspires you. Could be a teacher, some spiritual figure, or any figure that's inspiring to you. Could also be just a newborn baby that gives you this sense of the opening up of possibilities. The idea of awakening, human flourishing, whatever it is, just bringing this idea to mind and remaining receptive and sensitive to how it makes you feel. Pleasant, unpleasant, open, closed, uplifted, neutral. And continuing to breathe with it. and really connecting and knowing intimately these sensations that arise when you bring this person, idea, whatever it is, this inspiring theme to mind. and breathing in as if expanding it and breathing out as if releasing it into the world. At any given moment, you can bring back that inspiring theme to recover those feelings, that inclination. You may bring up something else, or you may just rest with the breath, the breathing of your body, however you choose.
and for the last few minutes within this climate I would invite you to connect with your good intentions, with your good wish or wishes for the current situation. The wish for this difficult moment that we are all living together to evolve as best as possible for people to be released from fear, suffering and this is not about considering what is possible and what is naive this is about connecting with the intention and so we just do the same thing we bring this good intention, these good wishes to mind expanding with the in-breath releasing into the world with the out-breath receptive to however connecting with this wish makes you feel conscious that right now there are dozens of people with you online thinking of the same good wish and feeling the power of that we are together people in the UK continental Europe and even the US and maybe other places I don't know of that people are connecting to this from may all be healthy may all be safe So, thank you for meditating together. Um, let's give a minute for people to stretch, stand up, and feel free also to drop a message of what was this meditation like for you in the chat. Whatever you felt, whatever you might want to share. Um, so that we, again, connect with each other and see the different experiences that this meditation may have occasioned in people.
Hmm. Seeing some of the responses. If anyone had a horrible experience, please don't feel shy to kind of change the tone and say, oh, this was, this was awful for me. I think it's important that, that we can all share how this, how this went. So the main idea of this of this meditation, to which I will I will I will come back at some point around the uh, in the middle of the talk, is that we may tend already naturally to overlook things that are going well. So we have this inbuilt attentional bias to focus on the negative. Now, when the situation is also helping to focus on the negative, then it even becomes more necessary, I would say, to do these exercises in which we don't try to argue with what's going horribly, but we just try to balance it and say, well, this is happening and, you know, probably it sucks, but there are still other things that are beautiful, that are inspiring, and we come to be perceptive of them as well, to have a more balanced picture of what's going on in our experience in the moment. The description for this uh, event started with um, an observation by writer and journalist Joanne Didion. And she was interviewing people who experienced Pearl Harbor. And um, she did a book about these experiences and others. And she noticed how tales of great disasters almost always start with this, um, with emphasizing how unforetold it was. So they will always start like, it was a normal sunny, or it was an ordinary Sunday morning. It was a great day, who would have thought? Um, perhaps someone suddenly dies and people would go, I saw him uh, the day before. And he was just his usual self. He left uh, in the morning cheerful, he went to work, he was excited about a presentation, whatever. So it seems that although we know in the back of our minds that these things happen, whenever they do happen, they are always a surprise, a shock in some sense. So if I go back two months ago to the beginning of 2020, if we all go back to New Year's Eve for a moment, um, I would have never thought that 2020 would be shaped by something like this, that is going to shape 2020 and potentially the rest of our lives. Because the changes that this may bring about, for better or for worse, may have consequences that outlive um, the outbreak of this pandemic. And I cannot speak for anyone else, but at the beginning of January 2020, this would, would have been the last thing that crossed my mind. And in this way, I connect a lot with the legend of the Buddha that a lot of you will know, uh, maybe um, some of you will not know, the legend goes that the Buddha was born a prince in an Indian kingdom in the north of India. 
and his father wanted to protect him from knowing the misery of the world. So he locked him in a palace where he was shielded from anything that might make him connect with the vulnerability of human existence. But then, inevitably, in several outings, several trips outside of the palace, he met a different reality. And the shock is explained that he met an old person or a sick person, and he didn't even know what that was. So he asked his attendant, what's happening to that person and why is it happening to them? And the attendant was, well, this is happening, you know, this happens to all of us. This will happen to all of us. And the Buddha at this point, I would say, if he had a chat at Sangha Life and was asked, how did you feel about that? He would have said some of the things that you said. Fear, disbelief, um, frustration, uncertainty, anxiety. Of course, this is a legend and I don't want to burst any bubbles, but there is nothing historical about it. Um, of course, he would have known pain during his life. This happened when he was 29. It's hard to believe that anyone can live for 29 years on this earth and never get sick, never know anyone who gets sick or not have grandparents or have forgotten, as is his case, that his mother died when he was one week old. So he obviously knew that. But for me, this contrast between the unrealistic legend and the reality that he must have known pain mirror very much the contrast in ourselves that we know that these things happen and yet whenever they happen, they are a shock and a surprise. They are old news that are still news. And the fact of this vulnerability stayed with Prince Siddhartha and made him reshape his whole life and reconsider his whole life. And this fact of vulnerability of the human condition remained central to his quest, to his spiritual quest. And I would say that right now, this is what we are experiencing. We are basically the Buddha outside of the palace. And we are living very much the kind of experience that the legend tries to communicate of realizing the truth, the inevitability, the lack of power in front of this type of realities. I would imagine a little bit mischievously that if Prince Siddhartha had Twitter, uh, probably in his channel he would have a pinned tweet at the top just saying, I told you, we get sick. We die, we grow old, come on, I told you so. Um, and no matter how much we try to think of that, we are just prone to forget it. And today, as I was finishing to order my thoughts for this session, I suddenly remembered one of my favorite poets, Cesar Vallejo. It's a Peruvian, Peruvian poet that uh, in many ways is a poet of suffering, is the poet of pain. And I found quite a good English translation of one of his poems. And I would like to read to you uh, a fragment of that, of that poem. It's quite a long poem. It's called uh, The Nine Monsters, Los Nueve Monstruos. And I will read to you the first two stanzas and then jump to the last stanza. And let me assure you it's not especially cheerful, but I hope that it also becomes clear 
why I chose it, and in what small ways this poem is remarkably suited to our specific situation today. The Nine Monsters. And unfortunately, pain grows in the world at all times. It grows at 30 minutes per second, step by step. And the nature of pain is twice the pain. And the condition of martyrdom, carnivorous, ravenous, is twice the pain. And the task of the purest herb, twice the pain. And the goodness of being, our double pain. Never, fellow humans, was there so much pain in the chest, in the lapel, in the wallet, in the glass, in the butchery, in the arithmetic, Never so much painful affection. Never did distance strike so close. Never did the fire play better its role of dead coldness. Never, minister of health, was health so fatal. And never did headache extract so much forehead from the forehead. And the furniture had in its drawer pain. And the heart in its drawer pain. And the lizard in its drawer, pain. Fellow humans, how can I not tell you that I cannot bear any longer? Bear with so much drawer, so much minute, so much lizard and so much inversion, so much distance and so much thirst for thirst. What to do, minister of health? Oh, unfortunately, fellow humans, there is much, so much to be done. After um, reading this, this poem again today, um, I realize why maybe it has come back to mind. I'm not sure it might be a complete coincidence, but there are points of contact, like when it says that pain grows 30 minutes per second. It felt to me it's a brilliant way to capture this exponential growth that we can't quite grasp. How there is pain everywhere, in the furniture, it's everywhere. The references to the Minister of Health, as how we depend on politicians. But then at the end, the kind of suggestion to do something about this. There is much, so much to do. And as, as I said, we resemble the Buddha when he left the palace. And in a way, we, we have always known that that reality is there just behind the walls. But as I said, we're forgetful. And as some of you may know, the word that is so fashionable nowadays, mindfulness, in its Indian languages, it meant in origin memory. It was about remembering. Remembering in the sense also of keeping something in mind, not forgetting it, not losing sight of it. So the same way that we sit in a formal posture and we try to not forget the breath or to not forget a certain attitude with which we relate to present experience. In the same way, a very, very common exercise in many uh, traditional Buddhist um, lineages is to remember our fragile and vulnerable human condition. There are different exercises to do that. And I just stress this to, to show how it is considered that we have to keep some contact with this reality. But also today, I saw um, this short comment by Jay Michelson, who is a meditation teacher from the US. And in relationship to the, to the COVID-19, he said, bad news is all around us. 
but we grow in humanity when we face it honestly. And that's the point of this emphasis in just meeting in all its poignancy, the fact that we are fragile, we are subject to illness, loss, we are vulnerable. And when we meet this situation, even if we try to embrace it, even if we try to welcome how the world presents itself to us now, it's very natural that we react in very different ways. And probably the one that um, is very alive now for many of us is fear, perhaps anxi anxiety, and the different things that you have been dropping in the chat. And here I find it quite interesting as a meditator that we can take this as an opportunity and also use our experience in meditation if we have to study what happens with something like fear or anxiety. For example, what does fear do to attention? And at the same time, to see how the different ways in which we direct attention have an effect on our fear and anxiety. I would say that in my experience, fear has an effect of narrowing attention. It becomes very narrow, very, very tunnel-like. It becomes quite intense, quite tense, and also quite focused on oneself. And it becomes kind of a loop in itself. And there is this narrowing and there is this contraction, usually around oneself. And it goes the other way around. What happens if in, in front of some of these situations, I just focus on myself? What happens to my feelings, to my sensations, to my mood, to my attention? And what happens if I think of others or I think more globally? Does it make a difference? I am the first that has had a range of feelings and emotions regarding uh, coronavirus for the, uh, mostly for this week, when it has become more and more apparent uh, the magnitude of this, as my, in a sort of scaled way, because my brother lives in the north of Italy, my parents are in Spain, and I'm in the UK. So in a few days, my parents will be in the situation of my brother, and in a little bit more, I will be also like following suit. And so fear comes up. And I have to be very clear that the point of this um, is not to flee fear or to pretend not to have fear and to think, you know, if I was a great meditator and I was very advanced, I would not feel fear, I would not panic. Panic happens. So the point is not to flee it or just avoid it or judge yourself for panicking. Panic is a very natural reaction of this organism. The point is to understand it and to try to get to know it a little bit better. Because there is some wisdom in that panic. It's well-intentioned, but it doesn't quite do the trick. Well, we have to understand whatever degree of wisdom and good intention is in there. And I would say that the fact that my vulnerability uh, is not locked deep inside, disconnected, but is very much on my skin, is my strength. I do not aspire to be someone who pretends he's not vulnerable and just acts cool. So whenever conditions really 
prompt this vulnerability. It has to be related to in some wise and kind way and not denied. So it's not about pretending not to be afraid nor to aim at not being afraid, but maybe to aim at not being limited and defined by fear and not to let oneself astray by it into dark corners of non-wisdom and non-empathy. Because of course one of the effects of being very self-focused is that you're very not other focused. So empathy is very lost. If I start stockpiling, I'm not thinking of the consequence of this for others. And so we have to meet our reactions to this situation, whatever they are, and then embrace them, understand them. And the next step, as we begin to comprehend how they operate, to not feed that reactivity, to not increase it, to not engage with it. And this is a crucial difference. It doesn't mean to suppress your instinctive reactions and your feelings towards this. It does not mean to pretend, it does not mean to judge. But also it does not mean to follow it, to buy into it. So we meet it, we understand it. And as we understand it, as with the example with fear and attention, then we start to see the relationships. Oh, when I'm afraid, my attention narrows. If I keep my attention more and more narrow, it feeds back into the fear. And as I understand this feeding process, then I can stop participating in it. And I don't have to do anything else. I just, in a sense, withdraw my contribution. I might just widen my attention, as was part of the suggestion for the meditation, and see what effect it has. I might see a train of thought, and then I just stop. I drop the conversation. I don't argue with it anymore. And also, it doesn't mean that I think there's no value in that conversation. It's just right now, I'm not continuing it. I just, it's like arguing with a troll on Facebook or Twitter or whatever. You just, this is my last comment, and then you switch off and do something else. Because whatever quality and mental habit is going on is always fed by something. If I, in some way, identify what is feeding it, I can withdraw it. And on its own, like a fire deprived of its fuel, it will slowly die off. Doesn't mean it will go away completely, and especially doesn't mean it will go away immediately. But deprived of its fuel, it will, of course, be weaker and weaker. So, against this narrowing of attention, we can widen attention. We can play with this in our formal meditation to emphasize this amplitude of attention, to counteract the tendency of fear to make it narrow. And you can play around with this and you can see what works for you during the following days. Um, suggestions are as I said, even if you're focusing on a very specific point, perhaps you feel very sharply the breathing on your nostrils or your upper lip, but still keep some background awareness. Um, bring in the whole body, awareness of the posture. Bring in sounds as a background awareness. Or even if at some point you feel yourself very anxious, just open up to sounds. Just prick up your ears. At the same time, against gloom, against the tendency to just see everything painted black, is a suggestion to also, also become appreciative to whatever is nice, to find what is still well and beautiful and inspiring. This can be done in formal meditation, 
as we did before, connecting with methods for finding appreciation, noticing what in the present moment is nice to whatever degree, but also outside of formal practice. I would say this is a time to sometimes be aware of your moods and your energy levels and use other resources like music. You just put on 20 minutes of really cheerful music. You probably know what music that is. You probably know there's a few songs that quite easily boost your mood. Use them. Just, okay, I will listen to this song every day, in the morning and in the evening, whatever. Recover some hobbies, something that brings you joy, something you do with your hands. This may sound very banal, but especially as we are entering probably into um, periods of home confinement, we really need to pay attention to our mental sanity and our spirits to keep them up. And I don't have really time to go into this, but if you've had experience from meditation retreats, it is quite useful. Um, but sadly, uh, this would be too much to pack into one talk. Um, but this might be a topic you you might want to um, to explore. Um, and at the same time, um, finding ways to get out of yourself. And this is the crucial, I come now uh, to the crucial bit of this from fear to love, which is to realize that this condition of vulnerability is not something that just happens to me, but is part of shared humanity. And so we are all in this same situation of fragility and vulnerability. And this helps us make the switch from fear to love. We recognize how our experience is uncertain um, how it's unstable how it's imperfect and vulnerable all our experience and this also means that we are dependent on each other and this makes the shift from fear to love we realize we have to take care of each other So um, just before going to the last um, part of my talk, just list a few other practical things that you may have probably already thought about, but just to name them, um, as we try to live and respond mindfully to this situation, having embraced it and having learned to let go or not feed the reactivity that comes upon our meeting this difficult situation. And the first one is to remain aware of our needs, especially our tendencies. Do I have a tendency to panic? Do I have a tendency to minimize? Do I have a tendency to disconnect when something is painful? And knowing our own tendency, know how to balance this. Also quite important, I think I have been feeling for myself, maybe I need to establish periods in which I take a break from coronavirus and have, if it's possible at all, to have a coronavirus free day or afternoon and to say, I'm not gonna watch more news for today. Keep a sense of humor and make use of resources that are becoming more and more available as Buddhist magazines, meditation apps and teachers put out advice for dealing with anxiety. 
put out guided meditations and really make use of all that. But also to take this opportunity to check on each other, to take care of those we love, uh, to look at community, to think who might need something that I can offer, to engage in things like this singing in the balconies, um, like Italy or clapping at the medical um, professionals and just show support. And also a uh, last thing before going to the, to the last part um, is about isolation. Um, I've been starting to read this book about solitude by Stephen Batchelor that makes the point that solitude in the uh, early Buddhist tradition was understood not only as a condition of physical solitude, but also that you are mentally aloof from preoccupations and thinking of everyone. And there's quite a lot of discourses in the early texts, in the early Buddhist texts, that show someone going to the forest to be alone, and yet their thoughts are like birds flying back to the city, flying back to common concerns. And this is not real solitude. Solitude in this case being something to praise and something positive. And I like to turn this on its head and saying that isolation as a negative thing um, is a mental state. So I can both be at home or with others and I can be completely alone because what isolates me is to be cut off from others by fear and by this focus on oneself. And as we are advised to stay physically isolated, we should do every bit possible to ensure that we are not mentally isolated, to keep in touch, even more in touch than usually, with people whom we love, with our friends and families, to keep in touch, to be home, but to be connected with others. And so I'll come to, to the end and perhaps to the conclusion and the real point of my talk. And this is uh, to go back one moment to the legend of Prince Siddhartha, of the prince who left the palace and encountered a harsh reality. Because there's a point where I disagree with Prince Siddhartha. Respectfully, with all due respect, I disagree with Prince Siddhartha. And the thing I disagree with is that this condition of human existence being fragile, unreliable, vulnerable, unstable and dependent is something to escape from. And this was very much the zeitgeist of India at the 5th century. BCE, but I think it's also very much an example of religious stance that devalues life, earthly life as we know it, in favor of some ideal which is not vulnerable, not temporal, not finite, not uncertain, not unstable, but is perfect, transcendent, atemporal, eternal, and I think the power for me of this Buddhist emphasis on facing our finitude, our vulnerability, and the fact that we are not self-sufficient entities, but that we depend on others, is precisely that it makes us confront this life and embrace this life. We may dislike the unreliability and change that are part of life, but I would point out that this 
change and instability is also a necessary condition for everything we love about life. So if we take it away, we take everything away. We cannot have the cake and eat it. I hope I've said that phrase correctly. Um, but everything we love about life, in a sense, is thanks to change and thanks to being subject to conditions and influence. So that when we meet these characteristics of our existence, we can turn it around as a source of love and as a source of commitment and community. It is only because I recognize that my time on earth is finite that it makes sense to prioritize anything at all, anything that I value. And it's not only my time on earth that is limited. My faculties, my health, my abilities are limited. They are not here forever. And it is only because I recognize this that it makes sense for me to prioritize what is of real value to me. At the same time, it is only because I recognize that what I value, be persons, relationships, projects, goals, ideals, is vulnerable, is subject to loss, is subject to breaking apart, can end, it is only because I recognize that something is at stake that I care and I have to care about it. And I have to do something for it. Because if being finite and being vulnerable are in a way um, two sides of the same coin, this is a weird coin that has three sides. And the third one is to be dependent. Um, I may need to unpack this, and we have time uh, in five minutes in the question uh, session. Maybe we do. But there's a philosophical argument that runs like this. Anything that is alive is engaged in the activity of self-maintenance. Any animal, any human, any organism is doing something to keep itself alive in a way that non-living things are not. My table, the desk on top of which I have my laptop, is not doing anything to keep itself alive. I am. I am breathing, I eat food, etc. But also, um, I'm finite means that what I need to keep myself alive does not only depend on me. I depend on something else. Because if it depended on me, I would live forever. I will clearly don't. I will not live forever. Therefore, I depend on something else that is not entirely under my control. So in this sense, to be finite and to be vulnerable is also to be dependent. And this is an inextricable part of existence. We have no choice about this. We depend on each other by definition. Things need to be maintained. And when I recognize that things need to be maintained actively and that things cannot maintain themselves, this calls for my commitment to care for it when I recognize that a person that I love, a relationship that I value, a project that I'm engaged in, be it personal, communal, social, political, planetary, when I recognize that it needs the engagement of individuals and circumstances in order to be maintained, I am called to commit to it if I value it. And in this sense, um, our commitment and care for each other is founded on the recognition of these three characteristics of finite, unstable, unstable, vulnerable, and dependent.
if you know anything about Buddhism, you might have recognized that these are the called the so-called three characteristics of existence, anicca, dukkha, anatta. Um, and what I have tried to do is to read them in a way that instead of being something we try to get away from, it's precisely what animates our life as part of a loving and caring community. And so in the title for this evening, From Fear to Love to Community, in a way, love and community are the same thing because it is through recognizing our shared humanity, namely community, that we move beyond fear and towards love. So um, this is what I have to offer this evening. I hope it has made some sense. Um, and I think now I will invite Daniel back into the conversation and we will look at your questions and comments. Thanks for that, Bernard. That was, um, that was awesome. Um, uh, Okay, so um, I think I think you can. So this part, this part, everyone who's watching right now, this part is the um, improvised part of the evening. Um, so bear with us. I think uh, Bernard, you can you can also click on on the question tab and. Yeah, I just found out now. <laughs> okay. Um. Did you want to read out the first question and then we'll kind of go from there? It's a difficult one. Um, um, it says, we start seeing a tendency to point to the other for blaming. Politicians, neighbors, other countries or cities. Um, some thoughts about it, how to react, uh, to be helpful and not worsen the situation. How important is shared humanity? Uh, great question from Yolanda. Um, I think seeing as though it's your evening, you should definitely start on that one. Well, um, with these things, it's always tricky um, because you cannot control what others do. In a way, I understand people who blame others. I don't agree with it. I think it's quite harmful. But through understanding how my fear works, I can see how that can lead someone into those things. Because um, if I start just to think about what others are doing so wrong about this, I, I might be doing the same thing. I might. So perhaps my first thought on this is to recognize your shared, your shared humanity with those who blame others. Um, and understand that this is a very difficult situation and people do what they can and they have the tools that they have. As to how to not worsen the situation, um, this is probably very specific to every situation and every person. Um, and I don't have a ready-made answer, um, really. You can call out on certain attitudes. If these belong to people that you know and that you think that you can make this receptive or that you can you can say it in a way that they will engage in a conversation with you, perhaps by showing uh, the dangers or the values behind certain attitudes. But this is quite difficult. There are professionals who do this. Um, what are your thoughts, Daniel? Um, well, the, 
there's, I guess for me, there's two parts to this question. The, the part around how do we respond to it, I think has been asked further down, um, further down the tabs by somebody else. So I'm mm -hmm. gonna kind of miss that bit and come back to that point when we get to that question. But on, um, on this kind of reactivity, I think, I think it, for me, it's, it's, it's really, um, it's really common, I think, for, so, you know, blaming, uh, the context that's been given here around politicians, neighbors, or even countries or other cities, when people react out of anger, like, why has this happened, you know, or they're kind of blaming. Um, if, I think if people look closely at their, at their anger reactivity, what is beneath the anger, which often gets missed is a sense of fear, which is something we talked about tonight, you know, like, I'm just thinking um, an example, maybe when you're in the car and you're driving, um, I've got a small uh, little boy called Oshan and you know, if someone was to cut me up or do something dangerous on the, on the on the road, my initial reaction is to get angry, right? But beneath that actually is fear, you know, like a like a fear response of like you know actually feeling um, unsafe. Um, but it comes out as anger, right? So I think um, I think paying attention to our reactivity, and um, even when you're maybe when you're hearing people. Um, do that kind of blaming game and kind of othering everything, everyone. Um, and maybe there's kind of like a strong reaction there. I think for me, it's about um, in that moment of, of my example being in the car, I think um, it's noticing that it's a fear response initially, even though it's maybe coming out of anger. And um, and what what can I do around that kind of fear response? How can I respond to that? Um, and there's, there's lots of different kind of practices around that. Taking care of my fear actually and being uh, and beneath that, again, taking care of my vulnerability, my sense of, oh, uh, I, I've just realized I'm vulnerable um, and I'm, I'm slightly out of control of my safety right now. Um, and how can I respond to that kind of compassionately and wisely rather than being reactive, right? And kind of being aggressive or, um, so that's kind of, and that, and that you can kind of, you can transfer that in any context, right? Um, um, so that's kind of like my response to that. But in terms of like, how can we do, what do we do? I kind of want to address that further down because I think there's some other questions around that as well. Um, okay, so I'll click done answering. Whether we are done answering on that, I don't know where I'm going to click the button and it will vanish. Okay. Uh, there's another question about um, how not to feed um, a certain environment of fear in, in conversations with friends okay yeah thank you for the dharma talk um it was very helpful do you have any advice about how we can try not to feed the fear in conversation with others many conversations are happening with friends colleagues strangers in public the escalating situation can we be honest in these interactions but also promote calm uh, and refuse to feed the culture of fear that's from alice um I mean, do you want to? Do you want to go? Do you want to? You, you can. Um, you can start. Okay, let me get the question back up. It covers your face, Bernard. When I click this, which is really sad because I like to look at you. Um, Thank you very much. I'm quite happy to have my face blocked by this comment box. We need to stop flirting and do do what we're meant to be doing. Right. Cool. Uh, do you have any advice? Okay, so, um, may. Maybe you can take this as advice, but for me, um, once I was given a really good piece of advice by one of my teachers around this, when I was told, um, I was kind of, uh, that I had a relationship with somebody, someone I cared about and uh, in, in my family, uh, but, but phoning them on, the, speaking to them on the phone was quite, it's quite difficult, it's quite draining um they kind of um, would suck energy away from you and i found it quite difficult to kind of be on the phone with them for long periods of time um the advice was to stop paying attention to because it, it would just be like a monologue right like talking at me for so long and it would just feel really heavy and also i'm a therapist right so sometimes that can happen in therapy um the advice was to stop paying attention or stop listening to what they're saying and listen to what they're feeling and in those situations that you're describing now where there's a lot of fear amongst 
in, in the dialogue between friends and colleagues and strangers in public. A real good practice I find in those situations is to um, kind of almost um, kind of almost just list, zone in and, and, and practice a, a, um, a particular listening practice and listening to what they're, they're feeling rather than what they're saying. They may not necessarily say, uh, although they may say I'm, I'm scared, but you know, when people start kind of um, just riffing with each other and getting into this kind of feedback loop of, loop of oh, this is really bad, did you see this? And did, you know, you can cut through that and listen to actually what they're saying, what they're feeling. And what they're feeling is, you know, it might be fear or angry about being angry or anxiety or anxiety. And as soon as, as soon as you're able to like hear the feelings rather than hear just the narrative that's being shared, there's a lot, look, there's more, there's a much easier way in there for empathy um, rather than just hearing this kind of wave of like just diatribe, right? So as soon as you're able to access or hear the feeling about what's being said, empathy is much more accessible and empathy and listening to, um, you know, um, when that's all therapy is, right? Is that you're listening to some, you're talking to someone and uh, you're in kind of like a psychological relationship in that moment with someone who can regulate themselves and empathically listen and respond and offer empathic following responses. That has such a impact on our nervous system and on our kind of neural network, which is why therapy works, right? So um, you can be that source of, you can be that, that kind of resource um, for those people. So in, if you're in a diet in your in a group of people are talking, you can kind of maybe just respond to feelings and be like, I hear you're feeling, I hear you're feeling really scared. Actually, it sounds like you're really scared, and it, it, it I'm feeling quite scared too. Um, it, this is a scary thing. Like empathize with what's happening, um, and therefore you're not feeding into this feedback loop of fear and like it's building up and building up, and you don't just contribute to that. Um, so you can be honest in these interactions. And promote calm. I mean, you can promote calm by just being empathic. That that has that effect, right? But refusing to feed the culture of fear of like, where's it going to go next, and and um, what's the next country, and all the it's just like, yeah, this is really scary. And how are you feeling? And I'm feeling scared too. And um, you know, these are the these are the things we've been told that can we can look after ourselves. Um, and these are ways I take care of myself. Like Bernard was saying, I take a I take a COVID day off, um, or whatever whatever works for you, whatever. Forms of refuge you have, um, so that's my response. I would that, that's a really good practice to have. I think when you're talking to people, I've I've minimised this from your face now. Um, there's probably the different steps to 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 what this question is uh, pointing to. The first is I would say to recognise in what ways I'm already feeding the fear so that I can stop doing that. Maybe I'm sometimes bringing up the topic. I'm not even aware of that. Or I'm adding comments that are really not necessary and just keep the conversation alive. So once I become aware of what I'm give, bringing in, then I have control over that. I said, maybe I can stop bringing up this topic. Maybe if the conversation is dying, that comment of mine actually revives it. and. So this is the part that you can do. Um, you, know, you have no control over what, you know, if other people bring the topic, of course. And then I think it's very uh, useful what Daniel was saying, particularly naming the feeling. If you say to someone, I think you're feeling very scared, and in some way you validate that, and said, you know, this is normal and I'm scared too. This is a... And also just get practical. So you get out of it's like yes this is bad and maybe we can do this we can do that we can follow these uh steps we can follow the recommendations um you know and it's going to be all right and in some way this might depend on the person um sometimes stating in a very calm way that things could go quite badly for some people can be freeing because part of the fear is just resisting that things could go bad and then when you just face that and accept it so this might not work for everybody but the point of the meditations that i um talked about at the beginning 
uh, traditional Buddhist meditations in which one repeats to oneself, I'm subject to aging, I'm subject to illness, I'm subject to death, I'm not exempt from this, etc. Uh, are not, the purpose is not to freak you out. It's more like exposure therapy. The point is that the more that you consider these realities in a safe space, as it were, you know, in, in, within some boundaries, in some formal way, you get used to them and you, you learn how to take them. I did this exercise with our uh, Sangha back in Barcelona and people had very mixed reactions. Some people felt anxious. Some people actually felt more alive and liberated in, a, in, in some sense. So getting practical, sometimes just acknowledging the situation and stopping that person from this aversion towards it might be another, another way. My mother is a doctor, she is a GP and she's 65. She was going to retire in a month. She's not going to, of course. And this is a very psychological shock for her. Um, plus she's in an age of risk. So when she freaks out and calls me, um, in some sense, one instinctively knows how to take those feelings and say, well, yes, there is a danger, there is this, that, you know, but you can try to do this. What I don't find helpful with her or other people is just to try to, in a way, counter their arguments or argue with them. No, it's not going to be that bad. No, don't think like this. Because this usually just feeds the fight, as it were. I don't know if it makes any sense, but... Yeah, I think that's, I think that's great. The, 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 the last thing that comes up, I know we're talking about this question a lot, but it's a good question and had quite a lot of votes as well. Um, I think when we enter this practice, right, when we get on this path, um, we're not we're not doing it to kind of develop like special powers, right? Levitation and and kind no. of flowing through the world as if um, water off the ducks, ducks back. You know what we're doing is we're simply developing the ability to hold space initially for ourselves, right, a and for the world around us, which is like constantly shifting and constantly unstable. But we don't see the shift and the instability because we're kind of mo most of us. Uh, you know, I'm talking particularly in the UK here, um, kind of, kind of have bubbled off from that, right? But um, right now, it comes directly into focus. We have, no matter how good you are at bypassing that, um, it's kind of hard to do so now. But in holding space, what I mean is, like, we learn this capacity to um, kind of hold, uh, access a sense of spaciousness, stability. What you're talking about in the, in the meditation. Um, tonight, um, this spaciousness, right? Um, that we access this that sense of stability in the midst of the whirlwind, in the midst of the instability, that this is our work. Um, and when we access this deep sense of stability, we become a resource for other people. Um, I think this is like the basic work and the kind of work we need to do. So when you're in those moments of when your mum is, you know, someone's mum is ringing or you're in a, um, in a group and people are kind of feel really disrupted and actually really under-resourced to deal with this, like you can be that stability, you can kind of um, hold space for the fear and all the things that are coming up there. Um, you know, and love, like uh, like um, Ben, I was saying, like love compels us to do this. So um, this is this is the work we're doing, right? This is being called to do it right now. Um, okay, uh, I'm conscious of time. Um, I think the next one can have a relatively short answer. Yeah, you go for it then. Um, it's asking about how to stop oneself being sucked into the news cycle that just feeds anxiety and Twitter, etc. Um, and how do you balance that with trying to be informed? I would say don't leave it up to willpower. <laughs> just establish mechanisms. I have an app on my laptop and on my phone that blocks certain apps at certain times in the day. And I just cannot access them. It's still possible, but you have to go through certain steps. So you kind of realize, 
ah, I'm doing that. It cannot be so instinctive. Um, also, all the distracting apps on my phone are inside a folder and I change the name of that folder from time to time because it stops working when I get used to it. But I've had things like no or distractions. Oh, really? Think again. And things like that. Um, it's not fool foolproof, but it's quite helpful. And you just establish some, some boundaries. You know, I check news in the morning, you know, when I'm having my coffee, whatever, and I check them in the afternoon and this is it. Uh, switch your phone off for a couple of hours. Go do something else. Don't rely on, you know, just feeling the urge, being able to do it very quickly, but having to resist it. Um, I would not rely on that. Helen, Helen just posted saying she does this and it really helps too. Um, I, I just want to add, like, obviously, 